And I've learned that when you face an injustice, you can go to anger when you see people being victimized, like that woman who's, who thinks that she has only one choice. But when I choose anger, it doesn't help me be innovative and think of how to solve the problem. It just causes me to be angry and polarizing and divisive. I can choose apathy, and that's the kind of posture that says, I can't do anything. And so because I can't do anything, I'll just do nothing. And I don't think that's a productive thing. When I found out I was pregnant again, after just having a baby at 17 and a half the year before, I felt so alone that I really didn't talk to anyone. And it's funny because you think, oh, you didn't talk to anyone. There was no one coercing you. It was all your decision. But when I was isolated, that's when my shame got the best of me. And I felt guilty. And I thought, I'm going to be another statistic. I just thought there's no way. Like now I know how hard it is to have a baby. I'm not sleeping. We have very little money, me personally. Uh, I am in school. I'm gonna have to drop out of college. I just work too hard and who's going to suffer? Um, the answer was Eli. The son that I had was going to suffer. And so I think for me and for so many other girls, abortion seems not only like the only choice, but really like a compassionate choice. I felt like I had never had an abortion, but I would have. And there was just something intriguing about the whole, um, you know, the controversy around abortion, the politics, what's true, what's not. We have collected over 4,600 legally admissible written testimonies of women hurt by abortion. And as we have read these testimonies, we've come to learn that forced abortion is a very widespread but little known problem in America. Once you make abortion legal, it allows other people to force or unduly pressure or coerce the woman into having an abortion to solve what they think is their problem. And so, long story short, I, I began what's called a medication abortion, and I wasn't really told too much about what would happen with my body, but after I chose it and after I swallowed the first pill, I felt alone and scared and guilty and like it was an awful choice for me personally and I began to think about you know what is this pill doing to my baby right now has has it already run its course has the pregnancy been lost and so I'm praying and I turn to my phone I'm typing in weird things like I started an abortion and I don't want to finish it um, I took the first abortion pill and I changed my mind and finally I get to a website which was at the time the APR abortion pill reversal uh, network and it was run out of San Diego which is about eight hours away from me. Give you an example the three most common types of forced abortions in America are number one adult parents or guardians forcing a minor daughter to abort her child. The second is a man forcing a woman to abort his child and the third is human trafficking or prostitution where the pimp or the trap trafficker is forcing the woman to have an abortion. At the Justice Foundation, we've learned that all of those are illegal in every state, even under Roe v. Wade, because whose decision is it supposed to be? The woman's. A voluntary abortion is legal at this time, but an involuntary abortion is illegal in every state. And so we've learned that it is very common here in America. I never was pregnant but I thought that I would have had I been pregnant. And then I got to be a certain age, around 24, and I was just relieved that I had never been faced with the crisis of an unexpected pregnancy. So then I wanted to find out more about what abortion was, what kind of help there, were, there was for women in a situation. And so I just kind of started doing some Google searching and I found a place in New York City soon after moving there that would accept me as a volunteer. And then I saw some videos on how abortions were performed. I started working with women that were considering abortion, and so my eyes really were super, were really opened to the need for help for, for women considering abortion. And I called them, and I talked to a nurse who was so kind, and she was the only person in the weeks leading up to this who actually 
processed everything with me. You know, how did you get here? Why did you feel like abortion was your only option? What's your home life like? What's your spiritual life like? What's your support life like? And what we really came to was, it's not that I wanted this abortion, it's that I felt like I had another choice. And so if someone could help me with all the other things that were going on, the housing situation, uh, the lack of resources, feeling like I was gonna be alone in this, um, then perhaps I wouldn't have chosen abortion in the first place, but no one, no one had. You know, you walk into a clinic and say, I want an abortion, and they give you an abortion. And I mean, I'm probably to blame to the, for that too. I walked in and said, I need an abortion, and that's what they gave me. But what I really needed was, was, was help and love and community and resources. What I think is productive is when I choose a posture of humility and brokenness, and I realize that I too have uh, a level of brokenness, and that girl that is facing this decision, there's some level of, of brokenness there. Then I become innovative. I can think of how can I, how can I let her know that she has other choices? How can I do that without carrying graphic images or carrying a picket sign or shouting in anger? And so, say the Storks, we've just decided to offer a free service, and that is we go with a medical, mobile, a mobile medical unit. And so she found a doctor. Um, he was about two hours away. And so you talk about access to healthcare, right? Like I, the, the only doctor near me was two hours away. And so I woke up early in the morning. It was less than 24 hours, probably 15 hours after I took the abortion pill. And I drove to this clinic and it really started to hit me like as I was driving there that I'd taken the pill on March 13th. And this was a Thursday, March 14th. And this was Eli's first birthday. I thought, oh my gosh, if I don't get there in time and this baby passes, March 14th is really forever going to be a day that I brought one baby into this world and took another one out. And I started to think about like a year ago today, I was on a table in labor and now I'm going to take medication to go into labor at home over a toilet. And it just shook me and, and, and scared me, but it encouraged me to try everything I could. I remember a girl that called me once though who found us on the web. And she said, uh, I think my mother is going to force my sister to have an abortion. And I know it because she did it to me. My mom forced me to have an abortion. And I don't want that to happen to my sister. So I met with this doctor and we started on the progesterone. And I continued on for probably six weeks until the 12th or 13th week in my pregnancy. And we didn't know what was gonna happen. I mean, I was terrified and then the abortion clinic found out and they said, you know, your baby's probably going to have abnormalities if you carry to term, which isn't likely. So another time I had a mom, um, she was heading into the abortion clinic and I asked her, I said, would you like to see how far along you are? She said, actually I would because I was in an accident over the weekend and I went to the, to the hospital, to the ER, and they asked me if I could be pregnant and I said, no way, I'm taking birth control, I'm not pregnant. And they said, well, we have to give you a pregnancy test anyway, and she said, fine. Um, and to her surprise, they said, you are pregnant. And, but they didn't tell her how far along she was. So when she bumped into me outside of the clinic, she said, yeah, I would like to know how far along I am, but it can't be far. It's got to be like maybe five weeks at the most. I said, okay, no problem. Let's go back and take a look. So she went with me, and um, we walked around the building, and we went back to where the van was. And she saw that she was 17 weeks pregnant. And she was blown away. She saw legs, arms, baby moving, jumping. She decided right then and there that she was not going in and having the abortion. We just want her to make an informed decision. She can parent that child and we will help her. Those people there with that stork bus are committed to not just seeing that the baby is born, but the baby is provided for and that that woman is provided for for many years. She can put that baby up for adoption and we have a line of people that would love to adopt that baby or she has the choice to continue going on into, have, into having that abortion. And we want her to know that we will be right there when she's done, if there's any guilt or shame or brokenness that she's experiencing, that we'll, we'll be there for her. You know, every time I coughed, I thought, this is it, I'm losing the baby. Like, it's a consequence of the action that I took in trying to abort the baby. And so I carried to term and on October 20th of 2013, I gave birth to another little boy, and he was perfectly healthy, and he still is perfectly healthy. He turned six this year in 2019, 
and uh, his name is Zachariah. In 1995, my biological mother threw me away in the trash, not knowing what to do, because back in 95, there was no safe haven law that there is today. The first safe haven law passed in 99, and in my state of Illinois, it passed in 2001. So I lucked out being found by a construction worker and being here today.